Good morning, everybody. If you guys could stand with us, we're going to jump into some praise and worship. We are glad you're here, and we're going to worship the God of all gods, the King of Kings here this morning. So here we go. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go.
God is speaking. Oh, can you see it? He's got your healing. Oh, just receive it. Receive the freedom. Oh, can you feel it? Heaven is reaching. Oh, can you hear it? Our God is speaking.
we worship you this morning. We praise you for who you are and what you've done on our behalf, God. God, we're inviting you into this space here this morning to come have your way, God. We're opening the door. God, I pray as we speak those things and we sing these words, God, I pray that hearts would actually respond to what we're saying here this morning that we would tear down walls that we've built up, our human walls, our traditions, the box we put you in, God. God, I pray that we would open that, God, and you would crush through that, Lord, and you'd show yourself. We love you here this morning, God. We thank you for how you respond and you inhabit the praise of your people, God. Your presence is so sweet here this morning, Father. So God, we just trust you here this morning. We thank you for what you're doing and what you're going to continue to do in the hearts of your people here this morning, God. We love you, Father. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. That is great. I could just uh, soak right there for another 15 minutes. No problem. God is good. Hey, every um, uh, hi from Pastor Bob and um, and Debbie, um, his wife. They are with Jay Seegert doing the Grand Canyon tour, and they actually should be back this evening. Um, but they planned that for a year, and that's uh, we're excited to hear all about that. <clears throat> Um, every other month we do Communion Sunday, and we want to make it a special point of emphasis and not just go through the motions, but um, think about what is communion. And I don't know where you're, where you're at this morning and where you come from, um, but I just wanted to, this morning before we partake in communion, for those of us that are doing so, um, to run through a few verses here. And the first one is Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah was a prophet uh, from Judah. Um, And he's prophesying to the Jewish people, writing 740 B.C. to 680 B.C. It's a long time ago. And along with all the other prophecies throughout the Old Old Testament scriptures of a coming Messiah and that God was going to have a way to redeem people and forgive sins and everybody's looking for what's this going to look like? How's this going to happen? He writes this in Isaiah 46, 13. says, I bring my righteousness near. It shall not be far off. My salvation shall not linger, and I will place salvation in Zion. That is interesting phrasing. It says, I'll bring my righteousness near. Like in a future time, God's planning to place salvation in Zion. Not just going to save people, but he's going to place salvation itself in Zion. Zion was commonly known as um, Jerusalem. Interesting. A little later on, Isaiah in, in 62, 11, um, chapter 62, verse 11. Indeed, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world, say to the daughter of Zion, the people of Judah, surely your salvation is coming. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Salvation is a person? Jesus? His reward is with him. A little bit uh, later on, another 150 years, uh, Zechariah comes on the scene. He's a prophet speaking to the people of uh, Judah. Zechariah 9.9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So Zechariah even sheds further light on this future event. The king has salvation. He's going to come in human form to Jerusalem. He's going to ride on a donkey, and he's going to have salvation. Salvation is his to give. 
Just crazy, the specificity of prophecy going on right here, and and the shedding of light of people understanding what is this going to look like? I mean, we know we're a fallen human race, right? We have sin, we have disease, decay, death all over the place, and and we long for that redemption. God has promised to give it to us, and what's that going to look like? And things kind of become clearer and clearer for people to see and know that when this salvation arrives, they should anticipate it and recognize it. And yet, when we get to Matthew, first century, Jesus comes on the scene, he's walking on water, he's doing miracles, he's healing people, raising people from the dead, and then he, after three years of ministry, he comes riding in on a donkey into Jerusalem, multitudes of people there saying, hail, king of the Jews. And he's coming in, Matthew 21, 5, tell the daughter of Zion, the the people of Judah, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly, sitting on a donkey, a colt, the fowl of a donkey. That's quoted as he's coming in. And yet, do you see where that comma is? There's something missing. Notice what is purposely omitted right there at that comma in Matthew. I think this is also in Luke. Having salvation. So here comes the king. He has salvation again, and he comes... And there is no official representatives of the nation to receive him. Multitudes of people, but no officials. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, where's King Herod? None of them are recognizing and or handing him kingship. And that was also, by the way, that's also prophesied throughout the Old Testament that the king would come and they would not receive him. That the stone that the builders rejected would become the cornerstone And so Jesus comes, and all this according to God's plan. God knew this in advance. Um, Jesus comes. He's crucified by the Jewish people. And I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go right back to Isaiah 62, 11. That last line says, and his work before him. So salvation is coming. His reward is with him. And his work before him. He had something he needed to do. Really cool. Jesus tells us of what that is, John 12, 27. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. In Luke 22, 14 through 20, when the hour had come, he sat down with the 12 apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. So summary, God's plan all along was to intersect with humanity through the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus was the promised Messiah, the Savior, to sent to take away the sin of the world. Jesus was without sin, yet he died a sinner's death in our place. All people who acknowledge their sin, they place their faith in Jesus as their Savior and leader, will experience the forgiveness of sin, they'll receive his spirit and inherit eternal life. When people stop clinging to themselves and striving and trying to accomplish a self-righteousness and they say, God, I'm a sinner and I acknowledge it and I place my faith in your graces and your mercies. That's what I need in my life. Then all of a sudden, and instead of trying to live my own life according to my own desires and my own ambitions, I'm going to live for you. That's a big moment. And Jesus' offer was this, you know, he said, I, he said I, came to, I came to seek and save the lost. He said, there's no greater love than one lays down his life for his friends. And here in Matthew 11, he says, verses 28 through 30, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Maybe this morning you're here and 
you're willing to humble yourself uh, to acknowledge sin and say, God, I need your mercy. I need your forgiveness. The good news is Jesus purchased that forgiveness and it's his to give. Salvation is his to give. And he gives it to everyone and anyone who comes to him. It's a simple heart posture of trusting in him, following him the rest of your days, letting him forgive you, letting him lead you and comfort you and challenge you and encourage you and correct you day to day, letting him be your best friend the rest of your life, letting him train you in his ways the rest of your life, trading your life for his life, your fate for his reward. You can simply say, God, I acknowledge I've done wrong and I stand in the need of forgiveness. I thank you for sending Jesus to be my savior. I receive your love into my life and I desire to live for you. I depend on you from this day forward. Teach me your ways. And if you're sincere in that prayer, then I welcome you into the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom of God. So, um, If that rings a bell for you or at least makes you curious, I encourage you to grab a Why Jesus booklet uh, on your way out today. These are free. They're at Guest Central. It just talks more about who he is and what he did, what he said, and his promises and his offers to us, and how we can be taught by him and led by him the rest of our life. So, Father God, I thank you this morning for your death and your resurrection. And Lord, we remember what you did and the price you paid and the love you showed in going there and doing that. We bless your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. You should have received or picked up um, a little cup with a wafer on top there. If you didn't, you can grab one of those. Those are available in the back. Um, Only requirement, uh, so communion is, is... Take, partaking in communion is saying, I believe in Jesus as my Savior, and I'm remembering what he did, and I'm looking forward to my future and, and the future we have with God. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's do that. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake. I 
Reflect on what you've done, God. You paid the price, Lord. We give you the glory here this morning. We give you the praise. And we fully understand, we take the weight of what you did here this morning, God. But God, just continue to work in our lives here this morning. We praise you, we love you, and we reflect on what you did, did on our behalf, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm Becky, and welcome to The Gathering. We're so happy you decided to worship with us today. Next Sunday, we'll be having our first ever hymn sing. This will be a wonderful evening of singing traditional hymns and enjoying a time of reflection. We hope to see you there at 630. Also, if you're looking for ways to get plugged in, check out our website for updates on our events calendar. We have all of our life groups posted on there as well, and you can join in for those at any time. If you're new around here, we'd love for you to fill out a Blue Connect card like this one so that we can get to know you a little bit better. Turn it in at Guest Central to receive your welcome bag and ask any questions you may have about our church. We can't wait to connect with you. On October 2nd, we'll be hosting a Life Church membership class after the gathering. This is a great step in getting involved. Here you will learn about our statement of beliefs and what it means to join the Life Church family. 
if you're new here or have been coming for years, this class everyone should take at least once. As always, Wednesday night is family night here at Life Church. We have classes and programming for all ages, so bring your kids, neighbors, and friends. The adult study dives deeper into God's Word with great teachings and discussions, while the children's ministry and youth group offer a fun and upbeat atmosphere to learn more about God, all while making new friends. Also, coming up on October 16th, we will be holding a child-parent dedication during the service. This is an opportunity for friends and family to celebrate and support parents as they commit to raising their children to know and love the Lord. To sign up, please check out the dedication page on our website. And finally, if you're a parent or guardian of little ones who might get noisy during the service, please check out the mother's room right outside the auditorium or the family room at the end of the kids' wing, room 104, where you can continue viewing the service live on TV. That's all I've got for you today. Have a great Sunday and enjoy the gathering. All right. All right. You guys ready? Me too. Me too. Before we jump into our sermon, I've got some exciting stuff to share with you. Just going to start with our, our mission vision. Uh, love God, love people, love life. That's the new life that God's given us, the new purpose that we have, the abundant life. Uh, we really want to see people come to see Jesus, know who Jesus is. We want people to be free of all the hurts and the hang-ups and habits that are harmful to them or detrimental. We want to see people get freed from those. We want to see people growing in their faith. We want to see people equipped uh, for the calling that God has placed on their life individually. So more and more of that happening, that's what we're about at Life Church. Um, that's what you're about. That's what I'm about. Um, so I have to say, in the last um, three to four years, there's a lot that's been happening here, a lot that God's been doing in our hearts and um, our families. And when COVID hit, you, you know, <clears throat> everybody took a second to, to think, hey, what is COVID and what's going on here? Over the next year, our church grew. We grew in numbers and we grew in giving. And we continued to grow since COVID hit. We actually, in 2019, we started, um, uh, God had put a passion on a lot of people's hearts to start a Christian school, Mount Horeb Christian School. And that began in 2019. Um, in 2021, we, oh, here's some pictures, some, uh, some of the kids there from this year. They're part of the school. We have over 60 kids in the school this year. That's only a few of them. Um, in 2021, we had the opportunity to purchase some land behind the church to the south of the church, 27 and a half acres to go with the seven acres that we are already sitting on. And so we bought that, and we were praying. We weren't exactly sure, hey, what, what does God want to do with this, or what might God want to do through us uh, for his glory? But we prayed, and we purchased the land, and... Um, as time went on, and even in last year, we started becoming quite um, cramped in the church and with the school. And so I don't know, if some of you guys are here on Thursday or Wednesday night, I apologize. Um, every room is being used in the church, including pastor's office. They have the youth, uh, one of the small groups meeting in Pastor Bob's office. We, had a, we shoved a lot of adults into room 104. Uh, occupancy in that room is probably 12. We had 24 adults in there. And this week, I promise, Wednesday night, we're going to have you somewhere else, and you're going to have plenty of room. There's room for you. Um, so we have a few adult electives going on, and then kids programming, of course, on Wednesday nights. So anyway, um, the school also is using every room in the building uh, all week long, Monday through Friday, and we thought, hey, we want more people to come to know Jesus. We want more people to grow in their faith. We want more people to be equipped. Um, we need more room. And so began talking to some architects, and it seemed that God kind of brought the right people um, for the building to build, and even people with uh, the funds that had the same vision. And so we started scheming, and some of you were at the business meeting in March, and we kind of laid out a, a rough draft of, of what we thought things might look like and where it's going. And we knew priority-wise we need to get some more classrooms, some more space for life groups and small groups and youth and for the school uh, and that can be shared space, and that would be fiscally the most responsible thing to do. So, so phase one is already underway, and we already have the funds to complete phase one. You want to see what phase one is? 
Praise God. Praise God. So right here, um, go ahead and back out one more time. There we go. So this is our laser pointer that needs to be turned on. Here we go. There's our existing building, just this one here. And since that time, um, you'll see it. We put in a playground right here. That was the first step. We put in a playground. <laughs> That's part of phase one. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Yep. All right. Um, and then the church garden went in this past year, and that's really cool. And I encourage you guys to grab all the produce you can on the way out of church today. It's, it's all free. I don't know if you guys know about this, but there is a mile and a half nature trail that is completed. And a lot of us have hiked it, and it's awesome. So I encourage you to make use of that. Um, it starts right behind the shed in the back, and it goes all the way around 27 and a, actually 35 acres um, through wooded areas, down by streams. It's pretty fun. I had no idea if this, this happened without me even knowing about it. I found out about it and walked it, and it was awesome. So awesome. So that's done. Here's, here's part of phase one also. This building right here, and we're going to take up that green space that we use for church picnics and we use for volleyball and so forth. That church picnic space is going to kind of move down here. This is going to be flattened out. We're actually putting in a large athletic field right here. That's part of phase one. And, um, and I'll go ahead, go to the next. Um, yeah, here's a close-up of that. So here's kind of a patio, playground, basketball court. Um, all right, next one. We're just going to hone in on phase one here. There you go, yep. Yeah. So this is the building that's already been ordered. And if you drove up the parking lot, you saw where they began clearing trees out um, on that side for, for a road to go in and drop off um, for this door here. So it'll function well for the school and for the church for that extra room. Go ahead, go to the next slide. That's kind of the gathering, kind of a, a cafe similar to the room over here that'll be within that building, a cafe. And then um, there'll be some school offices in there as well, and then seven classrooms. This one's not quite to scale. It's, it'll actually be able to have about 25 kids in each classroom. And uh, some of the classrooms uh, connect, so we can actually get 50, 60 people in, which will be nice as well. Okay, that's phase one. Let's go to the next slide. Um, we'd love to continue. This would be the second phase, and, and this is, I guess, what we're raising money now for. If people want to give toward it, they can give toward this. Uh, this building here um, would be added. Right here is our current building, right here. And as you see, there'd be kind of this room that we're sitting in, in would become a new atrium. So doors would be put in there. This would become part of the atrium. We'd blow out that wall there. Just a larger atrium, room for people. There'd be bathrooms and uh, cafe type stuff here, guest resources. And then out through right here, there'd be a corridor right here into that building. And that building would be just about twice the size of this one. So we'd have two basketball courts in there for the church, for school, men's open gym, so forth. And then um, and about double the seating. And um, so that would be phase two. Go ahead and go to the next, next slide. There's kind of the whole phase one, phase two front. Kind of cool, kind of exciting. Um, and so, let me catch up on my slides. All right. All right, so, so yeah, we are in the process of uh, building um, that phase one. That'll be completed by June 30th. So nine months from now, that building will be up and, and going, Lord willing. And, um, and then phase two, as soon as we have the funds that, that, that are necessary to begin on that, we would, we would continue with that one. Um, we do have a donor that has offered to match, up, uh, match 100% of whatever is given for this project through June. So anything that's coming in for these building projects, um, 100%, that's, that's a good way to invest your money if you know it's going to get doubled. And so we're grateful for, um, for people that are willing to do that and have the same vision that we do to help people grow in their faith and know Jesus and be equipped to live for him. Um, if you do want to give toward that, um, here's, if I wanted to give toward that, I'd go to this site here, lifechurchmh.com, go to the giving uh, page. And then right down there, you can see Building Expansion Fund, and that's where you can give to that there. Um, I would say, please, if, if you're regularly giving tithes and offerings, 
Don't say, hey, I'm going to move that over to the building fund. That's our operating expenses for all the current ministries and everything we do. If you can't give to the building fund, no problem at all. Don't give. Don't give. If you're able to, you have something extra to give, you want to give to the building expansion fund, go for it. You can do it right there. Um, one last thing there, too, is um, for if someone wants to give donations like stocks and the like or donations above 50000 uh, please contact the church directly. All right, there's a building presentation. Looks <laughs> Yeah. All right, I'm excited about that. I'm even more excited about Ezra, Ezra chapter 5. And we've been working through the book of Ezra when I've been up here over the last couple months. Um, and so today we go into part 4, which is going to be chapter 5. The hand of our God was upon us. A little bit of... Um, Catch up for you guys, review. We talked about um, the nation of Judah had been in captivity in Babylon for 70 years, um, and they were going back to Jerusalem. And God had stirred the heart of King Cyrus. He'd stirred the heart of different leaders, a lot of people at the same time, for this to happen. And so the Jewish people are going back, about 50,000 initially, back to rebuild the temple and to rebuild Jerusalem. And they each have a part to play. Every person has a part to play, same as us today. Wherever we're at, whatever we're doing, God has a part for each of us to play. God stirs our hearts for things. He has plans, and he wants to stir hearts, and he can stir our hearts when our hearts are humble and when they're seeking him to do great things for the glory of God, for his kingdom. And so these people, they were embracing their location. They were exemplifying leadership. They were embarking despite fear. There was a lot of threats they were embarking anyway. They were, this was important, they were esteeming holiness. There was other parties that said, hey, we'll partner with you. But they didn't have the same value system. They didn't worship the same God. And, and it would have undermined everything that they were set out to do. And they recognized that. And they recognized, hey, the, the reason we went into captivity in the first place is we got off track. We, and we forsook God. And we started just living it up and living as the world did and, um, and relishing sin and and so forth. So they said, no, no, no. We want to do this. We want to build the right way. And they endured the naysayers and um, so forth. And then finally, the last time um, we spoke, we talked about Ezra 4. And they got going. God stirred their heart. They're being faithful. And what happens? They just face opposition like crazy. And there was five types of opposition in chapter 4. It just outlines it. Here's the opposition. One, two, three, four, five. The first is the false flags, people kind of trying to act like friends and get in because they want to undermine it. Um, demoralization warfare, they're just piling it on. The enemies are um, demoralizing and, and um, uh, discouraging every move at every time and questioning everything. And then disinformation, they're sending false information to the king. At that time, it's, it's Azuerus, it's Artaxerxes, um, these different kings that are in uh, Persia at the time. And, and so this information, and then the king, Artaxerxes at the time, he writes a decree saying that they have to stop the building of the temple. And they're still working until there's physical enforcement. They come with arms, and they're forced to stop building. And that's where we left off last week. And I, I'm wondering um, if you feel like that at all. And, and I'm going to push on that a little bit after we read this passage. Number one in your notes today, if you're tracking with us, you uh, should have one of these. If you're online, you can download that, help to track. Ezra 4, we'll pick it up, review 4, verse 23 through 24. Now, when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum, Shimshai, the scribe, and their companions, they went in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews and by force of arms made them cease Thus the work of the, on the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased, and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Number one in your notes, when obeying God doesn't seem to work. And so I'd venture to spec, suspect that uh, the people were quite discouraged and, and quite confused, honestly, by this. The question is probably, what now? What now? We thought God had a plan. We thought God had stirred our hearts. We obeyed God. We even persevered through all of this opposition, and things still didn't turn out. Still didn't work. And when that happens, 
we feel hurt and confused and, and we get mad at God. Maybe that's you, maybe that's me. We've resigned to saying, hey, I'm just going to take care of myself now. I'm just going to do, I, I know what I want to do and how I'm just going to do, I'm just going to take care of myself. I'm going to do what I know to be best. Because it's too hard and it's too much of a letdown to trust God and to try to understand his methods and his timing and his reasons for why things do or don't happen. That is how the Jews felt at this time. After overcoming four different types of opposition, it was just too much, it was too long. And the heart can become cynical. That word came up a few times at our men's study on uh, Monday night. We're, we're beginning the book of James. And it talks about when you encounter various trials, count it all joy, my brethren, because it produces patience and steadfastness. And we talked about our hearts can become cynical sometimes when we endure hard times. Heart can grow cold. Hope deferred makes the heart grow cold. Another series on Wednesday nights, we really seem to be on this topic, the testing of your faith, a brand new topic that's uh, just started this last Wednesday. I encourage you to attend that. Anyway, when obeying God doesn't seem to work, we become confused and discouraged. We question God's plan. We doubt God's power. At least we're prone to do so. I don't know if you can relate to that this morning. And if you can, you're in good company. That's, I mean, that, what I'm talking about right now is the Bible. Is the Bible. It is Job and Joseph and Moses and David and Dan. I mean, that's, that's it, right? They, they trust God. They persevere through difficulties and opposition. And their reward is greater trials and more hardship. Yeah. Woo! Yeah! I trusted God, I persevered, I obeyed, I endured, and what do I get? More trials and more hardship. Wow. I want to tell you, number two, in your notes, God is still involved. God is still involved. Ezra 5, 1, next verse. Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, son of Iddo, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. It's good that they included that last four words, who was over them. You know, we, if you've been in a Christian for some time, you might be familiar with the verse that God's ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our, his, our thoughts, and so forth. And we want to respond, well, they should be. <laughs> Doggone it. They should be. He needs to get with the program. God's timing, his thoughts, his strategy, he sees a much bigger picture than we do. We have narrow vision, tunnel vision. We're constrained by our feelings, our time, our awareness. Question this morning, is it okay with you if God does things differently than you expect? Is it okay with you or not if God does things differently than how you want him to and when you want him to? Are you okay with that? She's not. <laughs> Mary and Martha, man, they, I bet they became cynical. You know, they, they called for Jesus to come to heal their brother who was sick, Lazarus, a friend of Jesus, and he doesn't come. Jesus doesn't come. He's not far away. He doesn't come. He doesn't, he's healing everybody all over the place. He won't come heal his friend. Mary and Martha are there. In John eleven twenty one, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. John eleven thirty two. 32, then Mary, when she came, she said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. I bet they were angry at Jesus. You think? I bet they were mad. Angry. Four days too late. Yet Jesus did care. He wasn't oblivious to the situation. He wasn't powerless to intervene. If you read the account, he, he's not without compassion. He actually wept there at the gravesite. I don't think for himself, but probably because he knew the hurt and the confusion that Mary and Martha and others felt. Do we think God does not keep records that he does not know how to administer justice or reward or punishment? Hebrews 11 
It's known as the Hall of Faith. We read about men and women of faith who throughout the centuries trusted God. Many of them saw God come through in, with miraculous, um, in miraculous ways. And yet, when we, the reader comes down to verse 35, it reads like this. Others were tortured. Men and women of faith, they're tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and chains of imprisonment. And they were stoned, and they were sawn in two, and tempted, and they were slain with the sword, and they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. They will be compensated. They will be made perfect. But it wasn't on <clears throat> this side of the equation. My friend, do not judge God before his final judgments. Don't prejudge God. There's coming a day when things that don't make sense on earth will make sense, complete sense in eternity. And be assured, just as God was over Israel, he is over you, and he's over me this morning. The afterlife, that's the great equalizer. That's the other side of the, the equal sign. Earth is not, say, earth is not heaven. Earth is not hell. Some people think it is. It's, it's not. Earth is earth. We get confused sometimes. <clears throat> so David, King David, man, he had the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, and he had a lot of both of them. And the guy who's on the lowest of lows, he writes this, Psalm 121, 3 through 8, about 1020 BC. Speaking of God, he says, he will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you at your, as your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forevermore. David had a lot of hard times. What do you mean he watches over me and he won't let me be harmed? In the grand scheme of things, and on the other side of the equal sign, this, this passage is dead on. It's true. It's true. Promises from God, Hebrews 13, 5, For he himself has said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. John 16, 33, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So awesome. So God's still involved. That's number two. God's still involved. God is with me in the good times. He is with me in the difficult times. Yes, he is. At chapel, on school, we say that all the time. Every Tuesday morning, almost. We say, God is with us in the good times, and he's with us in the bad times. He doesn't go anywhere. He's with us. He's over us. So that's cool. He comforts us. He knows how we feel. Um, he's not harsh. Um, you know, but at the same time, you know, he, he doesn't enable. He doesn't um, coddle. He doesn't let us waste the rest of our lives in self-pity. He doesn't do that either. He's not a resigning God. He's a redeeming God. Aren't you glad about that? Yes. He is a redeeming God. Woo, baby. That sounds like Pastor Bob. <laughs> Been around him too long. Good grief. <clears throat> God is still involved. Ezra 5, 1, then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, son of Iddo, prophets, prophesied. We read this already, but look at this now. Prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah. And Jer what did they prophesy to him? What did they say to him? They said God was still with him. He's over him. Right? That was good. That was important. They needed to hear that. They needed to know that. But they prophesied something to him. What did they prophesy to him? We find it by flipping the pages of our Bible over to the book of Haggai. And in Haggai 1... Verses 1 through 5, this is what we read. It says, in the second year of King Darius, does that ring a bell? 
because they stopped the temple work until the second year of King, well, here it is, the second year of King Darius. I think what I've, what I've seen is that this is about 17 years later after they, they stopped building on the temple, about 17 years later. In the second year of King Darius, the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judea, Judah, to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Number three, God's word challenges our perspectives and priorities. It does. We have our minds set on what we want to do and where we want to go and how things are going to be done and what's important and what's not. And then God says, taps us on the shoulder and he, he says, consider your ways. Consider your ways. And his word challenges our perspectives and our priorities. You see, these people, <clears throat> and Haggai knew it, and he was speaking on behalf of God. This people, this generation of Zerubbabel and John, they were called to greatness. They were called to do something specific that no other generation was going to do, and that was to build the second temple. They were called, God had a noble call on their lives to do something great. And they were missing it. They were missing it. They were missing their life purpose. That stinks. Go through life and you miss your life purpose. They were rejecting the nobility that God had placed upon them. They were forfeiting the great reward that God wanted to bestow upon them. He's an awesome father. He's an awesome God. And he has awesome plans and important things and nobility written all over us and, and missions for us to accomplish and rewards for us to receive. And the people are like, eh, it's not time. It's not time. I gotta install a new counter. Countertop. <clears throat> yeah. So Haggai is challenging him. He continues the very next verse, Haggai 1, uh, verse 6, he says, You've sown much and you bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put them into a bag with holes. He's, talking, he's saying, hey, guys, guys, recognize what reality is right now. I mean, you got some paneled houses, but you're living paycheck to paycheck. And things aren't, things aren't great for you, and you're prioritizing the wrong things. You're chasing after the wind. You're living for the material the temporal instead of the eternal, and you're missing the greatness that God has for your life. Jesus says that to us. Haggai is saying that to them. Jesus says it to us, but he says it like this. He says in Matthew 6, 31 through 30, don't worry about these things, saying, what will I eat? What will I drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything. God knows what we need and when we need it. He's able to supply that. If if there's something that we have to have and he wants us to have it, he's going to get it to us. That doesn't mean that we live irresponsibly. It doesn't mean we don't pay our bills. It doesn't mean that we don't save for the future. But if that's our number one priority, our priorities need to change. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. In fact, Jesus takes it a step further in Luke 9. He's talking, he says to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and he himself is destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and, in the holy, and of the holy angels. You and I have a chance of a lifetime. No pun intended. We can cling to our worthless lives or we can commit our lives into his keeping. We can live for God. We can live forever. 
And yet it's equally true that many will choose to reject the love and mercies of God. They'll cling to themselves. And of such, Jesus will be ashamed when he comes in his glory. Our faith isn't just lip service, right? There's, there's something attached to that faith. It's, it's lived out one day at a time. We're followers of Jesus. And so we ask different questions. We ask different questions. Instead of saying, what will make me safe and popular and rich and comfortable and happy? Instead of those being our primary questions, those are secondary. We might still ask some of those questions, but they're secondary. The primary question is, God, what will please you? What will honor you? What will help others know you and experience your kingdom? That's why we're here. And that's where the reward's at. This is cool. Um, so they say the time has not yet come, the time to build the Lord's house. You know, I understand because they had so much opposition and they tried and they were shut down. I mean, the door was closed in their face. And so they had to stop. They stopped, you know, and they're doing other things and, and, and so forth. And they're hurt and they're confused. And, and, um, but, you know, 17 years go by and, and then all of a sudden God stirs the heart of Haggai and Zechariah to, to breathe encouragement to the people and to challenge them, and to remind them God is with them, you know, just because things didn't look how you thought they would, and they didn't go how you expected that they would go, God's still working. God's still working. And, and they, they're, they're quick to say, oh, the time hasn't come, the time hasn't come, and, and Haggai challenges that. And when I thought of that, I, I actually, in my personal study over the last two weeks, I came across... It just, I happen to be reading in, in kind of different parts of the Bible, a little bit here, a little there, a little. And I, I saw, oh, wow, this is awesome. First I read in Genesis 8.22, this is Noah. He gets off the ark, and um, <clears throat> the world's wiped out, except for Noah, his family. And, and they're to repopulate the earth, and the animals get off the ark, and the vegetation starts growing again. And, um, and God says this to Noah. He says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest... Cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. While the earth remains, it's not going to remain forever, but while it remains, these things are going to be. And then another spot I was reading was, was Ecclesiastes 11. And um, Solomon, who wrote this book, he writes this. He says, he who observes the wind will not sow. We, we have seed time and harvest, but he who observes the wind will not sow. He who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know what is the way of the wind or how bones grow in the womb of her who is with child. I got to pause there. That is ridiculous. That bones grow inside of a stomach. There's nothing there. And then all of a sudden bones start growing in there. Okay. I dig that. <laughs> so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. Verse 6, in the morning, in the morning, sow your seed, and in the evening do not withhold your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. And so just with that seed time and harvesting again, I mean, he's, he's being very practical here, talking physical, you know, planting and harvesting and, and, and not just sleeping all day and wasting every day. But, um, but there's some spiritual implications, especially when we get to Galatians 6, 8 through 10. Look at this. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Man, that is awesome. That is awesome. That is awesome to prioritize the things of God and let God's word do that in us. And as we read the Bible, to let it rearrange our thoughts and desires. We meditate on his word and it changes us. It begins to change us inside, from the inside out. So Haggai, <coughs> Zechariah, they offer a little bit of correction a little bit of correction there to um, the people of, of Judah at the time. They encourage him. They also say, hey, it's time to do something. The people of Judah, they could have blown him off. They could have said, hey, guy and Zechariah, get off your pulpit. 
go talk to someone else. We're not interested. Instead, they humbled themselves. They responded. They embraced the correction, the call. A lot of verses in the Bible about correction, a lot of them that talk about um, when and how we should correct our children. And uh, there's a lot of verses up there right now. I, um, there's a Bears-Packer game tonight. Um, the only reason I bring it up is the Bears have a new coach, this guy here. And I've enjoyed, so far, it's only one weekend of the season, so far I've enjoyed his philosophies and, and kind of his schemes. And he talked about correcting players, and he said, correction's not ragging on them, and it's not trying to shame them. He says, we want to help our players improve. We're all on the same team. Correction is for, is for improvement. And, and will the players, so now, will the players be teachable? That's another, that's another part of the equation. But God certainly wants to correct us for our good, for his glory, and will we be teachable? 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, all scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I want to be thoroughly equipped. I want to be ready for whatever God has for me. We want to be ready for whatever God has for us. And we don't want to miss it. And so we say, yes, God, correct us. Please correct us. Don't let me go uncorrected. God, if I'm wasting time or going down the wrong road, please correct me. Please correct. I want you to correct me, Lord, because I don't want to miss it. And I don't want to waste it. Number four, God gives us renewed passion to restart the rebuilding process. Ezra 5, verse 2, So Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jozadak, they rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with him, helping them. That was a pretty effective pep talk, I think, that, that Haggai gave him. Good halftime talk, because here they go. Um, it says, and, and actually, this will be cool, the prophets even jumped in there, right? And started helping out. Look at Haggai's um, account of that. Haggai talks about that too. He says, then Zerub, in verse 12, he says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, high priest, remnant, they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent them. And the people feared the presence of the Lord. It means they prioritized it and they revered it. And then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke to the Lord's spoke the Lord's message to the people saying, I am with you, says the Lord. I am with you. To hear God say that about you and I, I am with you. That fills you with confidence. All right, world, let's go. I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel. He'd done that a long time ago, like 18 years prior. Now he stirs his heart Again, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua. He stirs his spirit, the son of Jehoshaphat, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. He's stirring a lot of hearts at the same time for the same common goal. And they came together. They worked on the house of the Lord, the God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. Number four, God gives us renewed passion to restart the rebuilding process. Subpoint: God wants to equip and empower us to live for him. Here's what it comes down to today. I believe what God has for us today is this. Has God stirred your heart in the past, friend, have you come upon difficult times? Have you been, begun to question God's plan? Or worse, has your heart become kind of hard or cynical? God is still involved and he's over you. And maybe it's a timing thing or there are things that are beyond our comprehension. Whatever may be, God is over you. He cares. His desire is to fill us with his spirit anew this morning. We want to respond to him. Let me encourage you to respond to God this morning. Let his healing come in. 
Let a strength come in. Let some optimism come back into your mind and your thoughts and some confidence back into your bones. God is not finished with you. God has a plan. And God is faithful and he's powerful. God, I pray for us this morning that you would give us a renewed passion to restart whatever rebuilding projects you have for us individually, Lord. Whatever areas of life that is, Lord, with relationships, Lord, in work, Lord, with our children, Lord, you give us a renewed passion to restart, Lord, ministry, work, to do our part, Lord, with your help, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you're trustworthy, Lord. We thank you that you're available and you're present. You're not distant. We thank you for your timing, Lord, which makes perfect sense to you. It's a little outside of our grasp sometimes. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for your word, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that it's there for us, Lord, to be trained by and shaped by and encouraged by and challenged by, Lord. Lord, we want to submit to you, Lord, anew this morning too, Lord. We want to kind of let down our guard and, and our, um, our uh, stiff arm of you and let you take the reins, Lord, and um, really surrender, Lord, to your, your ways. Put your health in us, Lord. Put your spirit in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys want to stand?
you guys have a wonderful week um, so yeah we'll have some prayer teams down front um, if you need any prayer here this morning um, yeah if you have to go god bless you guys <laughs>